to worship. Sing to our God a new song. May our words and deeds blend in harmony, giving voice to the spirit who moves among us. Come, let us worship. Almighty God, you come to us in fire rather than in ashes, in water rather than in dust, in the breath of life that drives out the stillness of death. Our breathing is life, which is you. Cleanse us from all that weighs us down. Turn our hearts to reach for you. Refine us until we shed the fears and worries that keep us from reflecting your light and love throughout our community. Free us from the language of excuse and justification that our lives might preach your gospel to all the world. Help us, we pray, to leave behind the shadows that threaten to overcome us so that we may live fully in the resurrection life to which the Spirit calls us. Amen. And now our hymn is Sweet, Sweet Spirit, provided with two verses. And it's a beautiful song. Forgive us our debt. 
And our reading this morning, one of them is Numbers 11, 24 to 30. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud, cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And the young man ran on up and told Moses, Eldad, and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of the chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would, all, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them? And Moses and the, and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. So here we are at the beginning of Pentecost, and you can see that Bobby made the entire sanctuary up here, the worship space, red, and it looks perfect. And this is even Bobby's outfit, and I love it. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to God and to those of you who are listening today. Today, uh, Rhonda read out of the book of Acts, and it's a follow-up to the Gospel of Luke, and it's assumed by some scholars, but not all, to be written by the disciple Luke. My favorite part of the Acts scripture of today is when the writer talks about how everyone there, people from all different places and languages and opinions, actually understood each other. What a total miracle that would be these days, right? People actually hearing and understanding each other even though they had different opinions. What a concept. In the last few years, we have had an increase of intolerance and folks not hearing what others say and feel. But of course, there were in Luke's time too, as there always is, skeptics sneering and saying it was no miracle. They said the disciples spoke different languages while being understood by the crowd. It was only because they had been drinking. As long as the world turns on its access, they will have cynics and skeptics here. And you know what? That's fine. They balance out all the jubilation and joy because God knows these days we need to jubilate. So let's do some of that every day. So what is this gospel?
are all about people in town from many different places and languages understanding each other. How does that make any sense whatsoever? And it doesn't really, but it must have made for an exceptionally exciting time, if not somewhat disturbing. The day of Pentecost occurred during Shavuot, a harvest festival which the philosopher Philo wrote about. Philo Judaeus, also called Philo of Alexandria, was a Greek-speaking Jewish philosopher and probably the most important representative of Hellenic Judaism. Now, Philo occupies a unique position in the story of philosophy, and he's also regarded by Christians as a forerunner of Christian theology. Philo reports on this event saying that a contemplative group of Egyptian Jews gathered together to celebrate Shavuot and the tongues of fire of Pentecost. The fire symbol symbolizes divine presence expressed in the text as being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that spirit gave them extraordinary abilities. Not only were tongues of fire dispersed over the disciples' heads, but there was an unexpected of wind. Now that's a day to remember, which it is every year at this time. So in the text we have two things happening. The disciples' experience as Peter is addressing them, and the huge celebration of a crowd of people. It's a kind of a micro and macro experience happening at once. Often I think kind of cinematically, that's my background in the arts, and this would make for a great movie about the inside revelation of the disciples and the larger historical activity of the masses. I happened to be watching the movie Titanic again the other night, which has a similarity. There is a micro Rose and Jack love story with a socioeconomic perspective on each character. And then there's the macro story of the turn of the century revolution and how the sinking of this perfect, perfectly engineered ship during a great period of innovation stunned the world. During 1912, a moment of great world pride and confidence and excitement the sinking of the Titanic stopped everything. This is a period of innovation that's important to remember and reflect on as we continue to develop our global innovations in cyber communication and all that entails. What iceberg should we be looking out for? We humans love to get caught up in the excitement of a crowd, something new, and a compelling speaker. Is it any different now than it was during the time of the earliest church? Excitement can spread like wildfire from the smallest campfire group of passionate disciples. Do we as modern day Christians still get excited about our church and go out and tell the world about how wonderful it is and how great Jesus was? What do we experience about the power of the Holy Spirit when we actually worship? Is there still excitement? I'm going to go way out on a limb and say that many people come to church to find comfort and tradition. And that's fine. It makes us feel safe, as if all things have not really changed all that much. But that, of course, is not true. Technical things, life, society, church are all changing daily as we speak. Keeping a positive perspective in mind, where do you see or experience a changing spirit in the work of your church community? What community efforts are we doing as a church which make a difference in God's world? Where is the spirit in what we're doing? These are all questions to ponder now and always ponder in being faithful Christians, examining the way we do church, both virtually and hopefully in person in the not-too-distant future. But I hope you don't jump the gun too soon. 
There's lots of things we need to do to prepare the church for your return. We want everybody to be safe and happy and illness free. Perhaps doing church outside might be a good start because apparently, according to scientists, outside is the place during this COVID-19 that we're the most safe. And we should really be 10 feet apart or more. So uh, as a pastor, I would urge you to think about all the safety measures and markings that you need to do to come together again. And I do understand that you want to come together again. And I do understand that you miss this beautiful sanctuary. Do we think that only God or Jesus can fix all the difficulties of being church in the 21st century? I can tell you firsthand, because I have served a lot of churches in different roles, most, if not all, churches are struggling with issues of identity and resources. And we need to pray. Prayer is a great idea. But honestly, it takes a lot more than prayer to turn the Titanic around. And that is what the universal church can be compared to. A big, powerful, old ship that needs turning and to be steered in the right direction. And that is up to us. That direction should be to God, to service, to education, and to compassion towards those in our community who are disengaged or pushed outside the circle of the comfort that we feel when we come inside. Prayer to God is good, but it's not all there is. We have a responsibility to act and to do good in the spirit of God. I think poet Marin Tirabasi says it beautifully in her poem that's called Serenity Prayer, for Pentecost. She writes, God, grant me the serenity to let the walk with me, talk with me, fix me, hold my hand, personal garden Jesus, just ascend. God, grant me the courage to stop trying, trying, trying to find my own voice long enough to be willing to lend it to someone whose words I do not understand, someone who gets no hearing in this world. And God, grant me the wisdom to recognize that the Spirit is doing all this Pentecost within community in mind. Amen. Let us be in a time of prayer. God of all, we come before you with praise and devotion, grateful for the gifts you have poured out upon us. We come before you dancing in body and spirit, singing in joy. We give thanks to you for the ways in which you have increased our understanding of one another and of you. Help us, Lord, to continue in this work of justice and peace, breaking down the barriers that separate us from each other and from you. Help us to strive against racism, classism, sexism, ableism, ageism, homophobia, and transphobia. Help us to listen to one another and hear your clear voice. Help us to look at one another and see you in each other's eyes. God of grace, thanks for the ongoing presence of your spirit in the world. We are still in need of refining and we are still in need of encouragement. Sometimes, oh God, the love to which you call us sounds absurd and impossible dreams. Do not let us be ashamed, God of grace, for believing in things that sometimes seem absurd, but let us drink deeply of your love, your spirit, that the words of our mouth and the deeds of our hands may call us and call others to believe as we do in your holy mercy and your all-abundant love. Help us to believe that by your compassion, by your grace, all barriers may fall and we, we may be one united in you. 
All of this we pray in the name of the one who prayed this unity for us, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. And now we're in the spirit, spirit of gentleness, and we're going to do verse 1 and 2. <laughs>